So hello everybody to the ITB Congress and I welcome you to the Destination Day 3. We'll continue uh, with our program discussing the phenomenon of over-tourism, a topic that some tourism managers don't like to talk about, but I think it's a very important topic, especially in some cities. Uh, I can give you some pictures from Munich uh, during the time of the Oktoberfest. So over-tourism is a problem, for, especially for inhabitants living very close uh, to the Theresian visa where the Oktoberfest takes place. Like the, uh, with the two presentations before, we will start uh, with a live voting. Uh, you have the opportunity to vote between five answers. The question is, over-tourism is already a problem in many destinations. What solution works best to fight over-tourism? And you can press one uh, button, uh, button one for smart technology solutions, two for limit access, three for higher prices, four for educational and recommendations, and number five is we shouldn't fight it. Uh, please press the button. So one third of you thinks education and recommendation is the best solution and nearly another third uh, means that limit access uh, will be the solution. So perhaps Dr. Dr. Lansky have some other solutions for us and that's the point where I want to introduce uh, Dark. He's an international tourism thought leader, a keynote speaker on many Congresses. He's a travel journalist and the author of several books. So we are happy to have you here, Doug, and the stage is yours. Thank you for that. Okay, let's get going. We don't have a whole lot of time. I just want to start with a little quote. It's one of my favorites from Paul Thoreau. As soon as a place gets a reputation for being paradise, it goes to hell. Another little contrasting quote I wanted to put up there. I love this. This is the old thinking. It's like the impact of tourism is huge and beneficial in every way, direct and indirect. As for overcrowding, well, what a great problem to have. I think we've heard a lot of comments like this over the years. This was in the New York Times in 1998. And in that same article, I saw this quote. What's the point of living in a wonderful city if many of the best parts are too clogged with tourists to enjoy? So these are the competing forces of tourism, the yin and the yang. And a lot of people have been denying this existence of the yang and just wanting to cover it up and not talk about it because the, the sort of prevailing, prevailing wisdom has been that that first gentleman who spoke, who said, what a great problem to have, has taken over the industry. But I think that just the evidence that you're here today acknowledges that this is a big issue. It's only going to get bigger, and we need to do something about it. And we've seen for so many years photos like this, and then you get there, and it looks like that. And there's lots of things. We can just go on and on all day. I could show things where they're showing us, and then the thing it actually looks like. In Norway, if the fjord is that, is the one on the website, and that's what it looks like in reality. This is Yellowstone in the summer, a giant parking lot. And when you get there, whether it's you yourself or you're working in the industry, you look at this and you have to say, this is a problem and we need to do something about it. And there are a lot of people thinking the exact same thing. And some of the articles getting written up, I know we have a contingent from Barcelona here today and I want to welcome them, special guests. This is, uh, and I don't mean any offense by putting any headlines up there. How about this, the small towns can't handle the sharing economy boomtown. This is a small town in northern Michigan where the city, they first were welcoming tourists in. They got popular, and now they're like, we're not that into you. This was interesting. So this is outside of Joshua Tree, a national park in California, where 7,000 people live there, and there are 200 rentals on Airbnb. And one of the locals said, we feel that the small town aspect of this place is dying. We are being forced to deal with the many boomtown issues that we never predicted, and they're not alone. All this stuff is from this summer that I'm going to be showing you today. Maybe not this one. Cruise ships, another huge problem I want to address today. 
everywhere you see protests in little islands. They're, they really are trying to stop the presence, and they have a hard time standing up to these huge industries by drawing little drawings. In Australia, they're boycotting. In Venice, they mounted an amazing boycott, the No Gran Navi, and they actually went out and swam out and started a human blockade to keep the cruise ships from coming in. I mean, you've got to hate cruise ships pretty bad to put your body in front of a cruise ship. We see the writing on the wall. This is what's headed our way. Almost everywhere you go in crowded areas. We should be looking at this. We shouldn't be looking away at it. We see it in a lot of places, and we need to fix the problem. Tourists can be a great thing if it's done in a good way. So here's part of the problem. They often talk about those great problem solvers. They see the solutions where others don't see them. I think, I don't know if I'd call myself a great problem solver, but I think part of that is looking to see where there's a problem where others don't see the problem. I think that's actually the first step. So I'm trying to kind of, another way to position that might be to call me a whiner. <laughs> but, um, I think it's, it's clever to look at it this way. So these are the three things I want to do today. The things you don't really see, the destination you don't see, how destinations are trying to fix it, and then which of these is, in fact, the best solution and the right way forward, if there is such a thing. Here's where the first myth to dispel. This is what's also been sort of the conventional wisdom, is that if you have a big city, well, they can absorb lots of tourists. If you have a small town like San Gimignano, they get overrun, but a place like London or New York are immune to it because they're so big. But what we've learned is, is that people don't go all over London, and they don't go all over New York. They go to a few key tourist spots, and they do overwhelm those spots. Here's, I got this from Visit Berlin, and I want to thank them for that. They were just looking at it this way. Hey, we're not nearly as dense as some of these other places. This is the number of overnight stays per inhabitant, how it stacks up against each other. But I don't know if that's the best metric. I was looking at it this way. How about how many, to see how dense the tourist population is, here's where the tourists go, one square kilometer in the middle of Amsterdam. They get, on average, that many visitors, there's that many locals who visit, who live there, and we can see that there's 7.8 visitors per local per day. That's the daily density of tourists. If we want to do the same thing in Venice on, a, on the summer season, 60,000 visitors jamming into that main one square kilometer, we know there's 4,826 locals that live in that area, and we see 12.4 visitors per local per day. Now, what's a benchmark for all this? I thought maybe we should use Disney. That'd be a fun benchmark. So we look at Disney, the Magic Kingdom, which is still the world's most popular amusement park. On an average day, they get 52,000 visitors. We're going to call the people who work there locals. There are no locals there. But we can see it's only 6.6 .6 visitors per local per day, essentially half that of Venice and less than that of Amsterdam. So when Amsterdam has been saying that we've lost our soul and people are comparing us to Disney World, that's why. The numbers add up. I've never been good at math, but even I can handle this. So here's the thing, what you don't see. So here's how we tend to look at how the masses tend to look at over tourism. They go, oh, a place is really crowded. Everything is packed. But it's not like that. In reality, it's more like this. There's one road that has a traffic jam on it, and there's a bunch of other roads that don't. And someone could look at that, as we do in tourism, and they'll say, well, look at all that capacity. There's plenty of roads there that all these roads are empty. But it's that one road off to the side that's got a traffic jam that's the way that people need to get to work or get home. That's the important thoroughfare. So to say that there's a lot of capacity here doesn't really address the problem. And that's how, unfortunately, a lot of tourism organizations are looking at over-tourism. They sort of expect it to look like this all the time, everywhere. And it just doesn't. That's not how, that's not how it starts. Because that kind of crowd is only in those few places, plus a little snaking red trail back to the train station. The mass part of these destinations don't have those kind of overcrowded pictures and images that we're used to seeing. Even Disney doesn't disperse their tourists equally. So here, this is the ride queues, the length of the waiting time at the different rides. Even within Disney, there's two hours waits for some queue and 20 minutes for another queue. So in a destination, it's even exaggerated more. 
So here is in the Vasa, I live in Stockholm now. This is the Vasa Museum. It's the most popular attraction in Stockholm. It's an old ship in there. This is what it looks like on most spring and fall days and maybe on some few summer afternoons. But in the summer, on the mornings, it looks like that every day. And I was speaking with the marketing director there and he said, we don't have an overcrowding problem at all. And I said, are you kidding? And I showed him this picture. He said, no, we're only overcrowded in the mornings during peak season. And so I looked at the numbers and I said, actually, that's 40% of your annual visitors experience your museum when it looks like that. Would you say that's a problem? And he just went, wow, I never, I never thought of it like that. Because I did another calculation, which is the way he sees it, which is about 3 to 5% of their opening hours for the whole year, it actually looks like that. So he kind of sees the whole year perspective. But in reality, that's how almost half their visitors experience this. That's a problem. And that's why it's difficult to see some of this stuff. And here's the thing. <laughs> having a little over-tourism is like having a little alcoholism or a little cancer. And maybe cancer is the best analogy because it kind of starts as maybe some kind of little brown mark and you go and ask your doctor about it. And that's kind of when you need to start acknowledging that there's something going on here not waiting until your place looks like Amsterdam in the summer or Venice in the summer. And I want to give credit to a lot of these places I'm talking to. They were very helpful. I spoke with the CEO of uh, Amsterdam Marketing, I Amsterdam. Barcelona's been helpful. Copenhagen, New York. I've spoken with a lot of these guys and uh, how they're solving these issues. And I want to explain what they're doing. One of the great things that Copenhagen did, they just came out with this report, is they took the first step and they're acknowledging that there's a problem and that they can't have an indefinite number of tourists. At some point, it's got to have a line. But they, what they kind of said was, they said this, we don't know what that number is yet. We know it's out there, but we don't know what it is yet. And moreover, 98% believe that tourism continues to contribute positively, and 787 think that they, you know, without reservation, that we have room for more. And then I got this from Visit Berlin that sort of said the same thing. We understand that over-tourism is a real thing, we don't really have it yet. It's kind of out there on the horizon. And look how this survey that we did, that everyone thinks that we don't have an issue. And now I have to ask you this. We didn't have the little clickers. We don't need that. How many people live in a place where you would, put your hand up, would you love to see busloads, tour groups, or just lots more tourists walking up and down the street where you live? Anybody? Would anybody love to see more tourists hanging out in your favorite cafes? crowding in there? Would anyone like to see more tourists jammed into where you live? No. So this is like how I have at dinner conversations as well. And so when I see that stuff, I just kind of go, bullshit. I don't believe that. And here's how I think it happened. I don't know if we can hit play on this thing. How do I just click? Nope. Can you on this? Whoops. I'll let you take over. You're driving. The party who had an opinion poll done, it seems all the voters are in favour of bringing back national service. Well, I have another opinion poll done showing the voters are against bringing back national service. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can't be for it and oh, against it. Of course they can, Bernard. Have you ever been surveyed? Yes. Well, not me, actually. My house. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bernard, you know what happens. Nice young lady comes up to you. Obviously, you want to create a good impression. You don't want to look a fool, do you? <laughs> no. No. So she starts no. asking you some questions. Mr. Woolley. Are you worried about the number of young people without jobs? Yes. Are you worried about the rise in crime among teenagers? Yes. Do you think there's a lack of discipline in our comprehensive schools? Yes. Do you think young people welcome some authority and leadership in their lives? Yes. Do you think they respond to a challenge? Yes. Would you be in favor of reintroducing national service? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I suppose I might. Yes or no? Yes. Of course you would, Bernard. After all you've told you, you can't say no to that. <laughs> so, they don't mention the first five questions, and they publish the last one. Is that really what they do? Well, not the reputable ones, no, but there aren't many of those. <laughs> so, alternatively, the young lady can get the opposite result. How? Mr. Woolley, are you worried about the danger of war? Yes. Are you worried about the growth of armaments? Yes. Do you think there's a danger in giving young people guns and teaching them how to kill? Yes. Do you think it's wrong to force people to take up arms against their will? Yes. Would you oppose the reintroduction of national service? Yes. <laughs> there you are, you see, Bernard. The perfect balanced sample. Right. 
So, we, so, I mean, actually, when I looked at some of these things, I almost saw that it almost read to me like a lead-up question. Do you like living in Berlin? You don't feel disturbed by tourists? You know, you're proud. It was like it almost led up in the same way that it pulled that Yes Minister episode to mind. They can get any answer you want with one of these surveys. You can. But, and I'm not saying that the people who've done these surveys have cheated or lied in any way. They may have done it completely honestly. I'm just saying that in all the informal surveys I've done, I've never heard one person including in this room, say they liked some of this stuff in the same way that I see with all these surveys. It just felt imbalanced to me. So I wanted to show that just to kind of give you, well, a little bit of a bullshit detector so you can sort of build that in. So here's the thing. How do you know if you have it? Well, there's not a great definition. This was the lame one that I came up with because I don't have a better one. If you have a queue or unpleasant crowding at any attraction, really at any time of year, because we can solve all that with time ticket entry, you have some kind of a problem that needs solving. So here's the thing. How are destinations currently trying to fix this? There's a lot of stuff. This has all happened within the last year. So there's a wave in Hawaii, and there were blogs saying that it's getting too crowded. So that wave has just instigated a new tourism tax on that wave. To stand on that wave, you have to pay a surf tax. Here in Dubrovnik, they admitted they had an issue, and they're <laughs> they were taking a lot of heat for being overcrowded, and they realized it. They could see it, and they decided that they are going to take a move and start. They realize that it's about 8,000 people is the absolute max they can take in there, but they're going to even, they're putting up cameras now to analyze the data and figure out what the best number is, and then they are going to figure out a way, they haven't done it yet, to get that number down and limit the people they allow into the old city. In La Cinque Terre, they have a new ticketing system that you have to use to walk the Cinque Terre. Even on Lombard Street in San Francisco, they want to have a ticketing system so you can drive down the famous windy road because it's driving the locals bananas. Those are some of the things that are happening. In New York and Amsterdam, they have a similar kind of strategy. So in New York, they've got the five boroughs, and they're trying to get people out of Manhattan and into these other places, and they're promoting it on their website. For example, this was one in Williamsburg, and this is actually one of their success stories, if you want to look at it that way. Although there was just an interesting piece on Skift where they did a little deep dive into New York, and then they had a podcast I was listening to where the guy who wrote it used to live in Williamsburg. And he said that this campaign was so successful, he got tourists walking up and down his street, and he moved out because he hated it. So this is what they're doing in Amsterdam. What they're doing there is they're recognizing these different neighborhoods. They're helping brand them and giving them their own identity, their own DNA. They kind of describe them, each one in its own way, help them out, drive tourists there. And they've done something else that's interesting. <laughs> they had this beach. They renamed it Amsterdam Beach. It had a different name before that wasn't anything like Amsterdam Beach. But to show that it was close to the city center, they called it Amsterdam Beach, and that gets more people to go there. They have another castle, and they renamed it Amsterdam Castle to, to just help people realize that it's very close to the city center and that has increased traffic to the Amsterdam Castle. Simple as rebranding. The problem with these two initiatives is just like I described with the podcast. When you're sending someone out to the suburbs to discover the real part of your town, and there's not a major attraction for them to see and do, they're gonna kinda walk up and down the streets and go to the cafes. And you're selling the authenticity of that neighborhood, which means it can handle a lot fewer tourists than maybe a crowded, touristy city center. So it's, it's a solution. It's like adding another lane to the highway, and we all know that gets filled up within about 10 minutes after it opens. So I don't anticipate this is going to solve the problem long term. It's just sort of a stopgap measure. And the other thing that Amsterdam did was they increased the range of their city card pass. So that with that city card pass, they promoted these outlying areas, and then they enabled people to get there by having a transport pass that, that did that. It's also quite clever. So what is the best one? Again, this is my version of it, and if, I, if you give me another six months, I may have advanced the thinking a little further, and I look forward to some questions coming from the audience later to see where you're at with this as well. I would say the right way to go is to find the bottlenecks. It's like I said, it doesn't all fill up at once. Something fills up first. So I just took Berlin. These are all as real a numbers as I could find in terms of the capacity. Now, if you do this, if you, here's how many people are coming in. And now, if we sort of know, so I'll just, I know it's a lot of numbers. So if you've got the Reichstag there, and I just, I put these ones in white because I made up all of those numbers last night after a beer. Um, 
So let's say that they can take 3,000 people a day at the Reichstag. And let's say on the first visit to Berlin, 10% of the visitors feel they have to go there. And on the second visit, it's 2%. And on the third visit, it's 1%. It may be lower. It may be higher. I've got no idea. I pulled them out of thin air. But what you do is you can get these actual numbers with a combination of surveys and then, of course, knowing the capacity of your attractions and your main walking streets and maybe a popular hiking trail like the High Line in New York. You have to know your, bus, your regular parking spots and your tour bus parking spots. And if you do these numbers, you do some calculations, and you figure out, OK, here's our rooms. There's our average occupancy rate. We have that many rooms. If you multiply it by 1.7, which is the number of average people per room, and you get that many overnight visitors. All right, if we know that 50% are first-time visitors, it's 34,000. We know that 10% of those want to visit the Reichstag, then you can get a number. That number has an extra digit on it. It should be 34,001. Forget the seven. So you can figure out these numbers. This is just to go through it quickly. And then you can start to see, well, there's our bottleneck, there's our next bottleneck, and there's our third bottleneck. It's not terribly complex to figure this stuff out. You just do some pretty basic math, maybe a survey, and you can see where your bottleneck is. And just like a traffic accident, when there's a traffic pileup and the cars are blocking and only one lane is open, you kind of get them moved off to the side, you solve the accident, get people in the ambulance, clear off the traffic, you relieve the bottleneck, and you go on. Here's another way to go after you've done that. This is a draconian measure. You can have city culture passes. Not everyone is as fortunate as Bhutan to have flights that limit it or live on an island. We all have very porous borders. So how do you limit the number of people? Well, what if we did this? What if we said everyone who's staying at a hotel for now gets a free cult daily culture pass for every night in a hotel? And with that culture pass, they have to use an ID number on it when they book a ticket online to any of the attractions. Or if they get to a museum, they have to show it with their ID that they have this culture pass. And let's say you make another, I don't know, depends on the size of your city, another 1,000 available to whoever, people staying with friends and family or Airbnb guests. And they have to go online and buy one. And it could be free, it could be one euro, it could be 20 euros for a culture pass. But basically, you have to have one of those to get into any museum. Which means if you can't get hold of one of those, you have to think to yourself, OK, is it worth going to Barcelona or Amsterdam or any of these other places anyway? Maybe I've got friends to see. I'm going to a conference. I don't need to go to the famous attractions. So you don't, you're not worried about the culture pass. But it's going to deter people. It's, going to, it's another way to say full for those main parts of the city that are getting overcrowded. That's the draconian way to go. The other way, which I prefer, is a transparent capacity, where what you're doing is you're essentially making sure that all the attractions have some kind of a ticketing system. Even if it's a hiking trail that's free, you've got to get a ticket for it. It could be free. You just have to book it online or book it someplace. And you have like a start time like you would with golf so the trails don't get overcrowded. And then when you go to book your flight somewhere, boom, this pops up. And all the OTAs will say, whoa, on that date that you're looking, of the top four attractions or five attractions, you can see that four of them or three of them are full. Do you still want to go on those dates, or do you want to adjust your dates to go on a day? You know what this is like? This is like when you book a restaurant that's really popular, and you call them up and you go, I could like to buy two seats, to a table for two this Friday. And they laugh, and they go, are you kidding? We can get you in in three Fridays from now. That's as soon as we can get you in. Do you want it? Take it or leave it. You've got 10 seconds. And you're like, uh, you know, you decide. They're going to lose some, but you're also going to get some to book out. And that's how you spread out the booking, by telling people that you're full. At some point, you have to be full. And the restaurant's happy about it. They're full. These guys are full. They're happy. They are stakeholders. They change the dates. They go when it's OK to get into those things, if that's what's important to them. And now you've spread out tourism. That's the mechanism I believe we need to spread tourism throughout to the shoulder season and off season. One last thing I want to try to tackle today, just a small one, the cruise ship problem. This is a huge issue. So these guys, they come ashore, they um, go to the toilet, buy a coffee, buy a postcard and a refrigerator mag magnet, and get back on their ship. They contribute very little to the local economy, especially compared to the overnight guests. I know there are numbers put out by the cruise ship industry that shows those numbers to be much higher. But when they are replicated by the destinations, they're almost never as high, not even close. So what do we do? I would say, look at their brochure. This was from just this morning. I looked at Royal Caribbean's. I downloaded it. 
I flipped through it. That's the cover. There were 49 pages about the ships. There were 49 pages about the destinations. So you have 50% of the product is the destinations, but are the destinations getting 50% of the revenue? No. The business model of cruise ships is to make money for cruise ships. They don't care, really, about the destinations at all. I like them to kind of like vampires. They are going around, and they are sucking the authentic cultural blood out of these places. And then when you're dried up, they go to the next one. That's why they're all running after the virgin blood of Cuba right now. It's what they do. That's how they operate. I know it sounds bad. So how do you take back control? What's one way to do it? you got to limit them somehow, but you want to lose the money. So what about doing this? We have weighted bidding. They have to bid, the cruise ship has to bid for every slot that they put in there. And by say weighted bidding, I'm thinking of it like this. You have the dive, the Olympic dive, and then they multiply that by the level of difficulty. So what's the interesting multipliers that could even things out and tip things to your advantage? What if you did it like this? So if you just have it like it is today, you don't put any weight on these kind of things, and you say that there's a, let's say it's a 20 euro per person port fee. That's what they're paying. Well, if you weighted these, I just picked a number, now you say you're giving more, I just picked two friendly boats. Here, this one's eco-friendly, so we're going to give them a 1.5 multiplier. This one's got a wealthier clientele. It's a very high-end ship. We'll give that a multiplier. They're coming, they have a lot of ships coming to you in the off-season when you have a hard time getting ships. We'll give them some credit for that. But they're not going to stay more than five hours, so they just get a one where the other one maybe doesn't have those things, but they're willing to stay for six hours, and also they have an off presence. Off so if you multiply those up, you can get a weighted bid. And what if you say, if you have three ships a day in your harbor, and you say, we're going to reduce it to two, but they have to bid, and you put the minimum bid at the price of the combined port fees of the other three. That's the starting price. So you can say to your port, you're going to get at least as much money as they currently get. And it's essentially we're using a me mechanism called supply and demand. Right now, they just can park as many boats as they feel like, and when they want to park more, they come to the city and they go, build us a bigger harbor. And sometimes when they don't, or even if they do, they'll just buy you out. The cruise lines are owning s at least 20 harbors around the world right now, and it's growing. It's a trend you want to reverse, because then you lose all control. That's what I have today. I want to have an interesting discussion with you. I'm glad we have a little bit of time left to do that, I hope. Tiniest bit. Tiny bit of time. Yes, right here. Thank you very much, uh, Doug, for your very interesting presentation. Thanks. It's good to see that you're actually thinking about solutions towards where we're getting to. Um, there's one little thing. Like I do think sometimes it's a little bit too simplified. Uh, take the Amsterdam example uh, of the spreading. That's a strategy that took seven years in the making. That's a lot of work, a lot of stakeholders that you need to get on board. And uh, similar with the cruisers, get those people on board to more or less block out the cruisers, if that's or give the system. Or um, go down. Yeah, but that's, that's tricky. Um, and I wonder, like, we, what we really need is tools to connect those people uh, and to connect cities, uh, city governments with each other so that they can take that stand and come up with alternative solutions like making residents profit not by finances but just experiences. Tourists bring good experiences too. Um, mm. So those kinds of things. So I'm wondering like, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there, there also comes an environmental damage that comes with the increased cruise ships as well. I think in general, they're not a great thing. They don't bring as much money per person as the overnight guests, uh, for starters. It's not a great long-term solution. If you're hitting your peak uh, levels of capacity in a number of the attractions, wouldn't you rather have an overnight romantic getaway guest there that's spending something like 400 euros a night versus a cruise ship passenger. So in the general trend, we want to elevate those and sort of reduce the amount of cruise ship passengers. We want to push them down. And yeah, it's a little trickier. They're in Glacier Bay in Alaska. They are using a bidding war and have for some time now. They don't have people coming ashore. When the cruise ships come into Glacier Bay, there's a ranger that comes out and meets them and gives a talk. It still was difficult because you've got, anytime you're going down, it's difficult. When you're going up, it's always easy. But they were able to show that they could have a lower environmental impact and have a strong economic impact by having bidding. 
It's the same reason they have bidding for the bandwidth of various airwaves that we have for, for almost everything we do in government. Bidding is effective, and it's maybe the most effective way to go. And if it's possible to bring in the same amount of money, what's to lose? I don't know. Uh, sorry, not, uh, I'm not saying it's easy. It is no. simplified. But yeah, I'm just saying yeah. any economic theory, when you boil it down to a three-minute presentation yeah. of a solution, no, no, can get very simple. I totally acknowledge yeah. that. And it's yeah. very interesting to see that. So no yeah. worries there. It's, um, just an, it's just an idea that I'm throwing out there, borrowed from some other yeah. sectors to see maybe this is a way forward. Yeah. So yeah. I don't want to pronounce this as like this is the be-all and end-all gold no, standard no. solution. But at least I'm trying to come up with something yeah. No, it's, it's the same. Right we are also doing research on how to do this exactly, okay. and actually working on that now in other smaller cities too. So that's an interesting thing to talk further on about, like what can what can you do in these different tell us, cities? Tell everyone about what you're doing yeah. right now. No, what we're doing work. We've done work with six um, metropolitan cities like Amsterdam, Barcelona, Berlin, Munich, Lisbon, and Copenhagen uh, to look at visitor pressure and what's going on. And we got ten different strategies, sixty-five methods of dealing with it. And we're now trying to refine that in smaller cities because, of course, smaller cities have trying different, to simplify it. different <laughs> issues. You need to simplify a little bit. <laughs> I'm just That's kidding. always the case. Um, and also look at um, festivals and events because, yeah, that's one of those things. In smaller cities, an event is, has a great impact, much greater even than in a larger city. So that's the next step. We're now looking at that with several cities, so 10 cities minimum. Do, that's great. Do we have time to hear from Barcelona real quickly for like a minute? If anyone from Barcelona wants to stand up and explain, Jean. I would just like to see like, any immediate feedback to some of these solutions or what you're thinking is going to be the big stumbling block for you. Because I know that a lot of people are looking to Barcelona of how are you going to solve these great issues that you have. And you have taken that first big step to say, I have a problem. <laughs> and you're now trying to find solutions. <clears throat> We are trying to find solutions effectively. Um, in fact, we, we are start to study uh, uh, through big data, knowing specific, specifically around Sagrada Familia, which is uh, one place in the city, as you know, uh, really overcrowded for the people. And uh, we're trying to identify which, uh, which indicators can us, uh, say when uh, we need to start a protocol for a for act in the place. The problem, in, the problem is when the, the, the space is an open space. An open space when the, living, the people is living there and it's impossible to close it. It's impossible to, to simplify the solutions. It's impossible to discriminate between tourists and residents. And the quality of life of residents is the, the main issue for the city, the city council of the government of the place. Probably another, another uh, perspective, another um, vision that we need to to, um, to add is uh, an, in the long term how to the um, promotion policies uh, helps or not or improve or, or, or not the solutions in these places because the um, I, I, we perceive that the the promotion the normal pro promotion strategies continues being attracting people in the, these places and the main um, big operators in the world. Uh, difficulty is not easy to change their strategy and to, to adapt the product to the needs of the cities. And for us, it's probably more beyond the, the local solutions and the, and the intensive solutions. We need to, to study together with them which kind of strategies we need to adapt for um, making the, the promotion as a tool for management. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out today. It looks like we're out of time. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Thanks. Interesting. Thank you. I think it's a very interesting topic. We could discuss the whole afternoon. Uh, and what, what I learned from you is th that uh, the picture of destinations between uh, heaven and hell is very impressive. So we come to the break now and we will meet once again a quarter to one and then we will discuss uh, the problem of safety and security. Thank you. <laughs>